Something disturbing happened in 65 BC. One night, while the city was sleeping, cloaked men stole up onto the sacred grounds of the Capitoline Hill in Rome. This was the very center of Roman public and religious life. It was where the great temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus stood, alongside other temples, and great trophies of victory, memorials of Roman triumphs. And it was later revealed that these shadowy men were acting on the orders of one of the elected public works commissioners of the year, the holder of an office called Edel, or Idile. His name was Julius Caesar. Through the night there were sounds of banging and clattering, men heaving heavy objects emanating from the sacred hill. The plan, which had been kept secret for months, was finally being executed. And the city awoke the next morning to find, to its horror, the area on top of the Capitoline filled with gleaming statues of Gaius Marius, the vanquisher of the Cimbri, nemesis of Sulla, champion of the people. Images of Marius had not been seen in public for more than 15 years. Sulla had purged the city of them. Some people were happy to see him back. Others, most of them among the Senate and the equestrian orders, the upper classes, men of power and influence, felt a tightening in their chests. I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the biographies of Greek and Roman heroes in order to sharpen ourselves to face the present. And to do this, we draw on the ancient philosopher Plutarch and his work, The Parallel Lives. In this episode, we compare the lives of Sertorius of Rome and Eumenes of Cardia. Plutarch paired individual Greeks and Romans with each other, hence the name parallel, which means next to each other in Greek. And in the case of Eumenes and Sertorius, he has a short essay in which he does this. That's nice. There's not always an essay of Plutarch's that survives. Sometimes we have to guess or infer why he's comparing men. So we'll read Plutarch's essay, and then I'm going to offer my own suggestion for something that we can take away from these men, and especially their legacies. Also, we have a guest narrator today to read the essay from Plutarch. It's short. Our narrator's name is Stephen Blackwood. Stephen is the president of Ralston College, an online and in-person institution of higher education located both in cyberspace and in Savannah, Georgia. Ralston is humanities-focused, and as they say on their website, they are dedicated to human flourishing, which is refreshing to hear from an academic institution these days. One of Ralston's mottos is, to think is to be free. Stephen is a friend, and we've studied some Greek together in the past. You can find more about him and about Ralston College at www.ralston.ac. Also, while we're at it, another announcement. Learning ancient Greek, and I mean not just learning to read the Greek classics in the original, but learning to think in the language of Homer, and Plato, Plutarch, and the New Testament. Well, in all honesty, it's been the most life-changing and permanently mind-bending thing I've ever done, in a good way. And I love sharing that experience with others. So I'm putting together a program for people who are considering beginning ancient Greek. So even if you're not sure, especially if you're curious but not sure it's for you, if that applies to you and you'd like to find out more about that, send me an email at alex at ancientlifecoach.com with the word Greek in the subject line. And you may be wondering why I opened with Julius Caesar. Well, that story is very much relevant to assessing the legacy of Sertorius. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, Plutarch's essay. And I will link to that too in the show notes if you want to read it later. And actually, we'll begin with a brief paragraph from the beginning of the biography of Sertorius, where Plutarch actually gives his reasoning for why he decided to compare Sertorius and Eumenes. So this is from the beginning of Sertorius's biography. Plutarch says, Both of them were fit for command and were cunning and warlike at the same time. Both were exiled from their own countries commanded foreign soldiers, and in their deaths experienced a fortune that was harsh and unjust. For both were the victims of plots and were slain by the very men with whom they were conquering their foes. 
So it makes sense to compare people who lived similar lives, who had similar fortunes, and who competed using similar qualities. Sertorius was a Roman in charge of Spaniards in Spain, fighting Romans. He never came back to Rome. Eumenes was fighting in various parts of the vast empire of Alexander, relying mainly on Macedonian and other foreign troops. Eumenes never returned home to Cardia after he crossed over into Asia, as far as we can tell. As soon as the first war of the successors broke out, that territory in Thrace where Cardia was located was occupied by his enemies. And of course, they were both betrayed by people who were on their team. So, similar stories. But now let's turn to Plutarch's comparison essay. Again, it's not that long, so we can hear the whole thing together here. And think of it as a free mini audiobook. And we'll pause occasionally for comment. So, Plutarch says, And now, as we compare the men, we find this common to both, that although they were strangers, aliens, and exiles, they were continually in command of all sorts of peoples and of armies that were large and warlike. But it was peculiar to Sertorius that he held a command which was given to him by all his allies and because of his reputation. And it was peculiar to Eumenes that many contended with him for the leadership, but he took the highest place in consequence of his achievements. So in Sertorius's favor, once he got to Spain, everyone on his side in the conflict deferred to him as the natural leader. And I could add here that Sertorius did have a legitimate office, originally at least, he was a proconsul of Spain. Eumenes, on the other hand, was constantly being undermined by Macedonian noblemen in this power vacuum after the death of Alexander, these loose cannon warlords who were theoretically his allies, but it seems like they all thought they were the best. At first, Leonidas, Neoptolemus, Alcides, you remember Perdiccas' brother, and then later, after he gets out of the little fort at Nora and becomes the commander of the royal armies, there were the Silver Shield captains, then Pucestus, satrap of southern Persia, and there were several others. And Plutarch goes on. Furthermore, the one, Sertorius, was followed by those who wished to be under a just command, while the other, Eumenes, was obeyed by those who were incapable of command and sought their own advantage. For the one, a Roman, commanded Iberians and Lusitanians who had long been in subjection to Rome. The other, a Chersonesian, commanded Macedonians who at that time were holding the whole world in subjection. So a little bit more elaboration on this point of how the people they commanded were different. And a reminder here, by Chersonesian, Plutarch means, again, Eumenes was from the Gallipoli Peninsula, which the Greeks at that time called the Chersonese, or the peninsula in Greek. And he continues about the different challenges they faced as leaders. Besides, Sertorius rose to leadership when a career in Senate and field had brought him admiration. But Eumenes, when his post as secretary, had brought him contempt. Eumenes, therefore, not only had fewer advantages at the outset, but also greater hindrances as he advanced in his career. For there were many who directly opposed him and secretly plotted against him, whereas Sertorius was opposed by no one openly, and only in the latter part of his career he was opposed secretly, when a few of his allies rose up against him. For this reason, Sertorius could put an end to his peril by a victory over his enemies, while Eumenes, in consequence of his victories, was in peril at the hands of those who envied him. Plutarch omitting the big elephant in the room here, Sulla, who certainly did try to block and oppose Sertorius, but that was earlier in his career. But it starts to get a little interesting here. Plutarch is suggesting that success makes you seem more worthy of your leadership in the eyes of people who are willingly following you, so it strengthens you. But if you're leading people who think they are somehow better than you, but for some reason are grudgingly acquiescing for the time being then actually those guys are likely to resent you more for winning. So there's a takeaway. If you're a leader, you need to do everything you can to read the character and disposition of your immediate reports. Ask yourself, are they following you willingly? Are they likely to break off and do their own thing as soon as your project wins them enough money or social capital that they can take a better opportunity? Is there any way you can become genuinely more worthy of your leadership position? 
to prove to them that sticking with you represents their best chance for growth and success. Now, we're already more than halfway done with Plutarch's essay, so let's go on. Plutarch continues. In their capacities as commanders, then, they were very much alike. But in their general dispositions, Eumenes was fond of war and fond of strife, while Sertorius was a lover of peace and tranquility. For the one, Eumenes, although it was in his power to live in safety and with honor, if he kept out of the way of the leading Macedonians, was nonetheless continually fighting them at the risk of his life. Whereas Sertorius, though he craved no participation in affairs, had to wage war for his very life against those who would not suffer him to be at peace. For if Eumenes had stood aside from the struggles for the primacy and been satisfied with the second place, Antigonus would gladly have given him that. Whereas Pompey's party would not even allow Sertorius to live, regardless of whether he gave up politics. Therefore, Eumenes was ever waging war of his own accord for the sake of power, while Sertorius held power against his wishes because war was waged upon him. Now we call a man a lover of war if he sets gain above safety, but we call a man warlike if he obtains safety through war. Maybe Plutarch has a point here. Eumenes could have just stayed a secretary, probably faded into obscurity like everyone expected him to at Babylon, he could have left the fortress at Nora in peace if he gave up war and politics. Or maybe even just accepted a subordinate role. Then he could have stayed governor of Cappadocia if he had just stayed on Antigonus's side after he was released from Nora. But he was not just warlike, Plutarch says, but a lover of war. Not just polemikos in Greek, but philopolemos. And Plutarch in this passage attributes this disposition in Eumenes to his pleonexia, which is the desire to have more than we have. Pleonexia. Sertorius, on the other hand, as Plutarch tells it, he thought about leaving all this war and strife behind and becoming some quiet farmer on the Canary Islands. Of course, then the pirates provoked him to go take up that war in Mauritania, where he met Ascalus and the bones of Antaeus, but it is worth remembering here, before we excuse Sertorius as a peaceable man, that he was also the sort of man that you could provoke or tempt with that kind of offer of war. And Sertorius did offer to lay down his sword and become a private citizen to Metellus and Pompey in Spain. But Plutarch notes in the biography that it was only after he won battles against them, when he was in a position of strength and so kind of when those commanders would have had to lose some face to accept his offer. So how much did he really want that peace? Certainly he didn't want it under any and all circumstances. Okay, so here's how Plutarch finishes his comparison with the death of both men. And further, the one met his death when he had no anticipation of it, the other when he was expecting the end. In the case of Sertorius, Death resulted from the man's goodness of heart, since he appeared to trust his friends. In the case of Eumenes, from weakness, since he wished to fly, but was arrested. Moreover, death brought no stain upon the life of Sertorius, since he suffered at the hands of allies what none of his enemies could inflict upon him. Eumenes, however, who was unable to flee before being taken prisoner, but was willing to live after being taken prisoner, neither took good precautions against death, nor faced it well, but by supplicating and entreating the foe who was known to have power over his body only, he made him lord and master of his soul also. Now this is kind of puzzling. This is the only place, as far as I can tell, that anyone ever says Eumenes did something like beg for his life or try to escape before he was caught. Maybe Plutarch's reading into the story more. Maybe his memory is failing him. Maybe he was writing this a little while after he wrote the biography. Or maybe he knows something that we don't know. Sometimes we run into these unsolvable mysteries dealing with original sources. But either way, there's a general point Plutarch wants us to take away here, which is true whether or not it applies in the particular circumstances, 
and that is that begging for your freedom is a way of losing your freedom because you fail to realize that true freedom is being independent of your circumstances and controlling your own will, a very stoic sentiment. As for Sertorius' death, he had been warned about Perperna, but perhaps he thought the best way to keep people from plotting against you is to trust them. Clearly that strategy entails some risks, but isn't the opposite true, that we can turn a subordinate against us by not trusting them enough? It's a difficult call. Once again, take measures to learn the character of your subordinates. So now you have Plutarch's take. Now since Plutarch covered many aspects of their characters and destinies in their own lives, that lets us focus more specifically on the legacies these men left. To begin with, both men had an exceptional reputation for justice and fairness, which won them much respect from many of their contemporaries and allowed them to lead successfully. Sertorius and Eumenes both recognized that justice and being perceived as a trustworthy and honorable person is all the more important in times of civil strife and power struggles, when the difference between opposing sides is based not so much on land of origin or ethnicity or geopolitics, but rather on who has the more just claim to rule. Both men had powerful foes who spread disinformation about them, and this threatened their legacies. But this is especially true in the case of Sertorius, so let's begin with him. For four years back in Rome, Sulla spread a negative story about Sertorius. He called him a duplicitous, tyrannical, resentful, power-hungry warlord bent on the destruction of the Roman state. And after Sertorius died, Sulla's narrative was the one that dominated polite circles. The negative story about Sertorius is actually present in some other ancient sources too. But Plutarch's story is much more positive. Where did he get his story? For this, we return to the incident in 65 BC in the life of Julius Caesar. So when Caesar brought the statues of Marius out on the Capitoline Hill, he was sort of resurrecting a ghost. Back in 82, once Sulla took control of Rome, he had Marius's remains dug up and thrown into the Tiber and had all the statues of him taken down. Sulla wanted to eradicate all practical memory of Marius. It's a practice called Domnatio Memoriae, destroying someone's memory. Julius Caesar, though, was a man of the people. Remember, young Julius Caesar had married the daughter of Cinna, who was the populist consul Sertorius allied with. Caesar's aunt had married Marius himself. Marius really married up. He got a big boost joining the Caesar family, the Gens Julia. So Julius Caesar wanted everyone to remember Marius, and everybody that was associated with Marius too. He wanted Marius's old friends and admirers to be proud and to look to Caesar now as the successor of Marius's cause. Plutarch got his story mainly from a guy named Sallust. Sallust was a member of this next generation, the generation of Caesar, Cicero, and Mark Antony. And Sallust was tribune of the plebs in 52 BC, and he became a strong supporter of Julius Caesar. He also became a pretty notable historian, and Sallust also wrote about Sertorius. Sallust was born in Amaternum in the Sabine country, pretty near Nursia where Sertorius was from, and he was about 14 years old when Sertorius was assassinated. Unfortunately, most of what Sallust wrote about Sertorius is lost because it was in his great work called The Histories, which is only preserved in a few fragments quoted in other authors. Sallust was a very cynical and pessimistic guy, but one of the few people that he did admire was Sertorius. Sallust thought Sertorius had been given a really unfair shake by his detractors, and Caesar, Sallust's patron of sorts, must have thought so too. Sertorius was a hero associated with Marius' side, and so Sallust wanted to set the story straight. And living when he did, Sallust was in a position to talk to a lot of people who had actually been there, fighting in Spain and Africa with Sertorius, fighting in the civil wars in Italy before that. 
Sallust wrote in Latin, but Plutarch knew Latin too, and so he drew heavily on Sallust when he was writing his own biography of Sertorius in Greek. So then, if we accept this version, this positive version of Sertorius that we've heard as the truer version, then we can observe that Sertorius didn't secure his legacy by building statues, naming bridges and roads after himself, or by trying to end with some last glorious hurrah like Marius, or by writing a book about himself to set the story straight like Sulla. Sertorius secured his legacy by being a good man. Maybe not by all of our own modern standards of goodness, but certainly by Roman standards. He was courageous, just, restrained, wise, and perhaps most importantly, he fought like hell. And someone inventive could even say that Julius Caesar ultimately won the civil war on behalf of Sertorius and Marius, defeating Pompey and the conservatives in the Senate in the next generation. Whether or not it was really the same conflict by that point is a question better left to the life of Caesar. So another takeaway from Sertorius's legacy will be that the most important part of your legacy, and often the most decisive one, is leaving behind you living people who admire and respect you. People for whom you gave everything you had to help and defend their rights, to promote their flourishing in the world, even at the highest cost. Who told Eumenes' story then? Who was Plutarch drawing on when he wrote some 400 years later? Well, after the fateful Battle of Gabienne and Eumenes' betrayal and its aftermath, Antigonus took most of the officers of Eumenes into his camp, and of those he didn't execute, he gave many of them jobs. And one of these men was Eumenes' friend and countryman, Hieronymus of Cardia. Hieronymus had been at Nora with Eumenes. He had gone on diplomatic missions on behalf of Eumenes. He fought in battles with Eumenes. And Hieronymus decided at some point that he would tell the story of his own momentous era for later generations. Hieronymus joined the moving court of Antigonus, and when Antigonus died, he became assistant to King Demetrius Polyorchites, Demetrius the besieger, Antigonus' son. And then when King Demetrius died, amazingly, Hieronymus continued to fill roles at the court of Antigonus's grandson, also named King Antigonus. He was called Antigonus Gonatas to distinguish them. And one ancient source claims that Hieronymus lived to be 104 years old. And Hieronymus really is the great historian of this period in Hellenistic history, the Polybius or Thucydides of this era. He's the reason that we know so much about Eumenes. There's even some evidence to suggest that he was a nephew of Eumenes, although that can't be proven decisively. Hieronymus' work doesn't survive on its own, but it is cited in various places, and historians have figured out that Plutarch was drawing on this man's account of Eumenes. And Hieronymus' story about Eumenes was very positive. Apparently, Antigonus and Demetrius didn't mind seeing their former adversary portrayed well. And Hieronymus' account is also the dominant one in other ancient authors who talk about Eumenes. Eumenes actually fared better in the judgment of history than any other of his contemporaries, save Alexander himself. The Hellenistic monarchs really do get a bad rap in history, and it's partly because, in one way or another, none of the successors really survived the death of Alexander with their honor intact by the end of it all, except for Eumenes. Antigonus probably comes off the best in the history books of all the rest of the immediate generation besides Eumenes, but he isn't really portrayed that positively by ancients or moderns. Plutarch has a biography of Demetrius, Antigonus' son, and it's really a cautionary tale of excess and delusion. Demetrius is paired with Mark Antony, who's another admirable failure of a man in Plutarch's eyes. But we can still ask, did Eumenes really deserve the positive legacy posterity gave him? And some among you have probably asked yourselves, was the unity of Alexander's kingdom really worth fighting for? Another way you can ask this question, perhaps, is people admired Eumenes for his loyalty, but is loyalty a virtue? 
I'm not going to get too theoretical here, but I did pull some philosophers on this, and you can check out the thread on Twitter. So thank you, Atticist, Athenian, Stephen, Pavlos, Alex, Martin, and others who contributed. It's debatable. Loyalty is related to justice. A band of thieves needs to trust each other, as Plato discusses in the first book of the Republic. It's related to obedience, which is akin to moderation for Plato. But you can also be loyal to an unjust ruler or an unjust cause. You might think it's a kind of steadfastness, but a steadfastness in what? So was Eumenes' steadfastness in Alexander's cause after his death admirable? Well, you might say Alexander's conquest was itself a colossal act of hubris, a legacy of destruction rather than unification. And yet, Alexander really did take over the Persian Empire. He didn't destroy it as such. The administrative system was still intact. He had promoted many existing Persian nobles. It had held together for some 200 years since the days of Cyrus the Great. Why not another 200 under new management? Eumenes, with his administrative talent, was one of the few people available who was perhaps capable of running that empire, putting it on stable footing. Perhaps he could have become regent, steering the kingdom to peace and unity. And how can we say that that wouldn't have been a better outcome than what ended up happening instead? Decades of internecine strife. Was Plutarch not being a little unfair by looking at Eumenes' energetic opposition to Antigonus and attributing it all to greed or love of gain, to pleonexia? Surely Eumenes saw that there were important things at stake that were bigger than him and his own interests. Eumenes showed loyalty more generally, too. He was faithful to his friends. According to Olympias, of all her friends, he was the most trustworthy, the most pistos in Greek. The related noun is pistis, or faith. When Eumenes refused to join with Craterus and Antipater against Perdiccas, at the outbreak of the First War of Successors, he said, I will die before I give up my pistis, my honor, or faithfulness. It was important to be faithful in his eyes, and Eumenes was perhaps the most faithful of the successors in another sense, a metaphysical sense. He was the man who truly believed in the divine forces that had brought them there. At least, he certainly acted like it. He told his troops about dreams from the gods. He told the satraps about dreams from Alexander. Eumenes believed profoundly in the power of religion and in the power of divine charisma to keep humans focused on priorities. Was there any more powerful force in history? How else had Alexander conquered most of the known world against all odds, except through the favor of the gods? How could he keep men following him year after year, battle after battle, if he was not somehow divine? How could Alexander command the loyalty and admiration of so many strange peoples without some continual blessing from the gods? And after he died, what hope did the rulers of the empire have except to continue to put their faith in the divine principle that had raised the Macedonians to the pinnacle of worldly power? Hence Eumenes' Alexander tent. And there were many other ways that Eumenes used to channel the charisma of his dead lord. In a faithless and suspicious age, once again, the man who believes, who insists on immutable principles or a credible higher power, may for that reason stand out in the crowd. And this faithfulness of his contributed a great deal towards creating his legacy. We could contrast not only Antigonus, but also Ptolemy, satrap of Egypt, a man of comparable skills and ambitions, a smart man, an impressive man, a dynasty founder. But Ptolemy was an opportunist, and he left a legacy of scheming and duplicitousness, which his descendants followed right down to the betrayal and murder of Pompey on the beaches of Egypt at the end of the Second Roman Civil War. In closing, we can observe that both Sertorius and Eumenes possessed great innate talent, but also a tremendous dedication to hard work and perfecting their skills. They were also motivated by powerful ambition. The Greek word for ambition is philotimia, 
which literally means the love of honor, philotimia. It's ambiguous in that language, just like it is in English. It depends on what it's directed at. Each man found a cause and a principle, thought by many to be just, and this principle became the groove into which they could channel their ambitions, thereby becoming stronger by focusing their energies, and thereby winning lasting glory. So yes, both Eumenes and Sertorius failed to achieve their temporal aims in their lifetimes. But from the perspective of a Homeric hero like Achilles, the kind that the Macedonian warrior nobility held as their supreme role models, you could argue Sertorius and Eumenes came off pretty well in the end. Because for an Iliadic warrior king, the most important legacy isn't your gene pool, it isn't even your political accomplishments. It's the stories people tell about you after you die. Thanks for listening. If you want to help us out, tell someone about this podcast. And if you think we merit it, go on Apple Podcasts and leave us a good review. Stay tuned for the biographies of Pyrrhus and Marius coming soon.